Amen. So if you're joining us for the first time, we're journeying through a series called The Prophets. There are 16 prophetic books in the Old Testament, starting with Isaiah and going all the way through. Four of those 16 are called the major prophets, 12 of those 16 books, and we're dealing really with the last 16 books, you know, of the Old Testament. Four are called the major prophets, 12 are called the minor prophets, but not because four are more important or what have you, strictly because the 12 minor prophets are very short, some are only a chapter long. We've been journeying through them and now we have come to some of the last of the prophetic books, namely Haggai and Zechariah. I mean, just think about the journey thus far. It's been about four months. And James chapter 5, verse 10, remember, this New Testament verse commands us to study the lives of the prophets. But interestingly, James chapter 5, verse 10 isn't just telling us to study their prophecies. It's not just telling us to study how Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be born of a virgin hundreds of years before Christ was even born of the Virgin Mary. James chapter 5 verse 10 is telling us to not just study their prophecies, but to study their personal lives. And as we see how these men, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Amos, Jonah, how these men stood in the midst of so much opposition, in the midst of so many trials, and stood their ground and allowed themselves to be ever strengthened, ever encouraged by God, James chapter 5 verse 10 promises us that if we study the details of their personal lives and their ministries, that we will also be encouraged to persevere through our trials and our struggles. It's so fitting because Jesus made clear in John chapter 16 verse 33 that in this world we would have trouble. He then said, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. We see that promise from Jesus. We see all throughout the scripture, saints struggling through trials. And then we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and it tells us, or 2 Timothy 3, that in the last days, it would be perilous times. The Greek word for perilous is hard to deal with. So if James chapter 5 verse 10 says, study the personal lives of the prophets, and you'll learn thereby how to stand in the midst of trials, and 2 Timothy chapter 3 says in the last days it would be hard to deal with. There would be so many trials that it would be hard to deal with. What a better time to study the lives of the prophets than now. So we come to Haggai and we come to Zechariah and you're probably already noticing that I'm taking two different prophets, two different prophetic books, and I'm kind of referring to them as peanut butter and jelly already. When we did Amos, I would only talk about Amos. When we did Jonah, I would only talk about Jonah. When we did Isaiah, I would only talk about Isaiah and what have you. But with Haggai and Zechariah, I'm mentioning them almost like Batman and Robin, right? That's because they ministered together. Not only did they minister together, but we're going to actually look at all of what was taking place and the time when they were ministering. How God used these two men you're actually torn, you know, as to whether do I study their personal lives, and as much as I want to look and eke all that I can about their personal lives, how God used them, and in what season, and what they said by God is such that it just is the, the most glaring element, and that's what we're going to focus on first. But first we need to give a historical backdrop. So first let's go to the handout, and... Honestly, here we are, and we're going to dig through a lot of scripture today, but when I came across this quote by A.W. Tozer, I just had to include it. I mean, hey, it's a new year, it's 2019, happens to be a time where many people decide to kick off a new Bible reading plan and what have you. Uh, among resolutions with believers, of course, Bible reading is always on that list. We want it to actually be number one on our list, right? But let's read this quote because it's just something that we just need and will stick with us. I pray you'll never forget it. It says regarding the Bible, read it much, read it often, brood over it, think over it, 
Meditate over it. Meditate on the word of God day and night. When you are awake at night, think of a helpful verse. When you get up in the morning, no matter how you feel, think of a verse and make the word of God the important element in your day. The Holy Ghost wrote the word, and if you make much of the word, he will make much of you. That's worth reading twice. The Holy Ghost wrote the word, and if you make much of the word, he will make much of you. It is through the word that he reveals himself. Between those covers is a living book. God wrote it, and it is still vital and effective and alive. God is in this book. The Holy Ghost is in this book. And if you want to find him, go into this book. I mean, wow. Does that right away just make you want to dive into Psalm 1? Blessed is the man who meditates in the word, you know, day and night. And this person will be likened to a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf does not wither and brings forth fruit in due season and what have you. The entire Bible, as we now jump into what's taking place around the times of Haggai, Zechariah, and Ezra, the entire Bible, in essence, is an account of an eternally benevolent God who chooses to give grace to his people as they deserve nothing but judgment. The entire Bible points to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Please look at these verses. Psalms 47 and 8, John 3, 16, Luke 24, 27. The entire Bible points to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which alone satisfies the justice of God and allows grace to proceed towards all those who call on his name while never contradicting his holy justice. The entire Bible showcases God's work of grace in and through weak and fallen man. The same mankind of whom even at their best state is still incapable of anything righteous or good. Thus the entire Bible makes abundantly clear why God alone gets all the glory, aka credit, for anything and all things and everything. I just felt it was fitting to just write that summary because we're going to jump in now and wrap our minds around one of the most pivotal periods in Old Testament history. And we need to do that to really appreciate and understand what Haggai and Zechariah did. Um, and even though they come in and there's just this one liner that all of the church knows, when we get to it, it'll ring bells. I've heard that before. Many people have written songs about this one liner that Zechariah will say. But when you understand the context in which God uses him to say that, and then you're able to look at how in your own life, how there's so many parts of our lives that we can always put in the same context. May this message today lead us to a deeper love and a deeper heart's cry for the Holy Spirit than we have in as long as we can remember. Now, before looking at Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah, we need to understand the history and the amazing prophecy, a.k.a. predictions, leading up to this amazing time period. I could have us turn to these verses, and I would recommend that if you're just quick with the fingers, you turn to the verses, even if you're not. You need to learn how to use your Bible, you know. Um, but I just felt it was fitting to put it in a handout because I think of many of you commuting. I think of many of you even just up in the morning before heading out the door, and you're just wondering, okay, what do I read? And, you know, I wish I took notes at church, and, and then you have this to look at, you know. So, one, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, one of the most amazing verses in the Old Testament. God says, I am God and there is no one else. I am God and there is none like me. And this is how I separate myself from other so-called gods. I alone tell you history before it happens. And from ancient times, I will tell you things that have not even been done yet. Bible prophecy is how God... That's how God's chosen to make clear that out of 27 religious books on planet Earth that all claim divine authorship, 
how God makes clear that the Bible alone is the supernatural word of God. And in another set of chapters in Isaiah, you even see God offering the challenge, who are these other so-called gods? Let them come forward and relay and tell us things before they have him. So we're going to look at Haggai. We're going to look at Zechariah. But first we need to look at Ezra. And we're going to look at how the three of them are related. We need to understand this history of what's going on. So Let's look at these prophecies from Jeremiah first and then Isaiah. And they're mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Are you ready? So first, we're going to look at Israel's captivity. Jeremiah is going to prophesy about Israel's captivity due to their idolatry, their hardened hearts, and their refusal to repent and heed God's messengers, the prophets, and also God's promise to never cast away from him and to even bring them back to the land. It's Jeremiah 29, verses we're no doubt familiar with, but now you're going to know the context. It says, For thus says the Lord, When 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope and expected end. I'm using the Amplified Bible here uh, because I love the way it just adds in, just it amplifies, you know, the meaning by using enough English to give more of the illustrative, you know, Greek and the Hebrew. So before they even go into captivity, Jeremiah prophesies that you will go into captivity this captivity will be for 70 years. Obviously, that's where we see Daniel and Daniel in the lion's den, all of that during the captivity. You will go into a captivity for a failure to repent and your hardened hearts and your love of idolatry. But after 70 years, I will be faithful to bring you back because I will never cast you away. And I know the plans I have for you to bless you and not curse you. So with Jeremiah, we see that in Jeremiah 29. Now, here's the next set of prophecies. And that's how the sovereign and merciful redeeming God will bring his people back. Even, and check this out, even predicting, prophesying that it will be done through moving the heart of a pagan world ruler. So, how many of you knew that, yes, Jeremiah prophesied that the Israelites would go into captivity? How many of you knew that, yes, Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity would actually be 70 years long? And the reason we know we could take Bible prophecy literally is in Daniel chapter 9. When Daniel is in Babylon, he reads Jeremiah, Daniel chapter 9, reads that Jeremiah says it would be 70 years, looks at the calendar, realizes 70 years is almost up, gets on his face, seeks God for revelation, and that's when he receives the 70-week prophecy as we know it. So we see people in the scripture taking Bible prophecy literally. So yes, we knew that Jeremiah prophesied that they would go into captivity, that Jeremiah prophesied that they would go into captivity to Babylon, that Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity would be 70 years and then God would bring them back because God will never cast away his people, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. But these next set of verses, my prayer is that they get you as excited as they get me. How many of you knew that Isaiah prophesied not only that there would be a captivity, not only prophesied that they would return like Jeremiah, but that Isaiah, before this pagan king is even born, Isaiah prophesies that it would be through a pagan king, God turning his heart, and God names him by name before he's even born and before he even has a name. How many of you are aware of those prophecies? So again, if Jeremiah's prophecy is dealing with Israel's captivity due to their idolatry and refusal to repent, here, Isaiah's prophecy is dealing with how the sovereign and merciful, redeeming God will bring his people back, even predicting that it will be done through moving the heart of a pagan world ruler. The Persian king Cyrus gives a whole uh, new HD, if you will, to Proverbs 21 verse 1 when it says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord 
And he could turn it wheresoever he desires, just as turning a small little stream. God is sovereign. Let's read these verses, starting at Isaiah 44, verse 22, on the back of the handout. First, he says this to them. Look at all of their idolatry, all of their rebellion. God would send them prophets, and they would throw the prophets in dungeons. They would kill the prophets. God says, you want to love your idolatry, and you don't want to repent of your idolatry? I'm going to let you go into a land so full of idolatry that it'll be coming out of your nostrils. And then you'll be ready to repent. And even though you've broken my heart a million times and though you failed me a million times, I will never fail you once. I am betrothed to you no matter how much you break my heart. And I will bring you back. And I know the plans that I have for you, plans to bless you and not to curse you. That is the good news. That is the gospel. That is our Lord as the faithful one. That is our Lord as a sinner's savior. That's why we love him. And the word makes clear that we love him because he first loved us. And the Bible says herein is love. Not that we loved God. We have no framework of what love is in this fallen world. But God loved us. He's teaching us what this love is. So look at what he says. And now this adds more context. He says, and this is speaking to people who had burned their children in the fires to Molech. This is speaking, even when I was in Israel 10 years ago, I went to some Canaanite, you know, um, ruins and still I saw altars of human sacrifice that are still standing, which means even in Jesus' day growing up, he could walk from Nazareth across the valley of Megiddo and he could look at those ruins. And so I was looking at the same ruins that Jesus looked at, you know, where those Canaanite human altars are still there. And even with the Israelites getting caught up in all of this demonic stuff, look at what he says. I've wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud. <laughs> And your sins I've covered like a heavy fog is the idea. Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. Shout for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout in triumph, you depths of the earth. Break forth into jubilant rejoicing, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and he shows his glory in Israel. For the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb says this, I am the Lord, maker of all things, who alone stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, frustrating the signs and confounding the omens of boasters, false prophets, making fools out of fortune tellers, counteracting the wise and making their knowledge ridiculous, confirming the word of his servant and carrying out the plan of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall again be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall again be built and I will raise up and restore her ruins. That, brothers and sisters, is what the entire book of Ezra is about. It is I who says of the deep be dried up and I will make your rivers dry. And then look at this. He's mentioned now him covering their sin, him blotting out their ugliest, darkest sin. And that's what we celebrate by the blood of Jesus and by the gospel of Jesus. Amen. And now he's saying, I'm going to bring you back. And then he says, I'm going to rebuild the ruined cities. And then he says, this is how I'm going to do it. It is I who says of King Cyrus, he is my ruler. Here's a pagan king worshiping pagan gods, not even born yet, not even named yet. And God is saying, there's going to be a ruler in Persia. He will maybe think he's even God. But he's really my shepherd, my ruler. He will do what I say. He will carry out all that I desire. And he will say to Jerusalem, she shall again be built. And of the temple, your foundation shall again be laid. Then Isaiah 45 continues with what he says about this King Cyrus, who's not even born yet. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and of Israel, my chosen. He's saying, I'm doing this. Because of, because of my babies. 
Oh, my babies have been caught up in some stuff. My babies have been barking up the wrong tree. My babies have been sticking their nose in places where it doesn't belong. My babies have been rebelling. My babies have been giving me lip service and playing religious games. But the thing is, they're my babies. They are mine. The Lord knew what he was getting into when he redeemed each and every one of us. I'll say that again. The Lord knew what he was getting into when he redeemed each and every one of us. And he's saying, and notice he doesn't say because they deserve it. Does he, do you see anything in there about them deserving it? Oh, they've been through 70 years and, you know, you know, and they deserve a break, you know. And, you know, you know they, 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 they cried like I've never seen crying done. Those, those cries have earned it. Grace is what we could never deserve. He says, I'm doing this because they're mine. Israel is my chosen. And you could write down Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, when the Lord first redeemed the Israelites out of Egypt. He says, you know, I did not set my love upon you because you were some big mighty nation. Actually, you're the runt of all the nations. But I set my love upon you because I love you. So he says, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and of Israel, my chosen, I have also called you by your name. He's speaking to this King Cyrus, this pagan king who doesn't even know who he is and has not even been born yet and not even been named yet. He says, look at this. I've called you by your name. I've given you an honorable name, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there's no one else. There's no God except me. I will embrace and arm you though you have not known me. Look at this prophecy. You know, Josephus, Jewish historian, tells us that when Alexander the Great was conquering the then known world, and he conquered the world faster than any other general in any other empire. Matter of fact, our U.S. military still uses tactics adopted from what Alexander the Great employed, a, a military genius. But Josephus tells us that when Alexander the Great came upon Israel on his way to conquer all the way to India, that the priests ran out and showed him where the Greek empire was prophesied in the book of Daniel. We don't have proof of this and it's not in scripture, but Josephus, most noted Jewish historian, tells us Alexander the Great, seeing that the Bible would mention his reign before he was even born, fell on his knees, gave sacrifice, Told, spared Israel and told his Greek soldiers that we're not conquering them and if they serve in our army, do not prevent them from worshiping their God. No evidence that Alexander the Great gave his life to the true and living God, but that is what Josephus tells us. It is amazing to see the scriptures not only spell out empires beforehand, but to even mention kings and rulers before they're even born. Not to mention kings and rulers that aren't even aware of God the true God and his message and his people. Amen? So now, you see the prophecy speaking of the ruins being rebuilt. Now, doesn't this help you appreciate the book of Ezra even more? Well, let's read. It says, the book of Ezra. It's a book chronicling the fulfillment of both Jeremiah's and Isaiah's prophecies concerning Israel being delivered from their captivity in Babylon and brought back to their homeland, which they had lost due to rebellion and failure to repent. It is a book about resettlement. It's named after Ezra, whose name in the Hebrew means help. He was a priest and he led the exiles in a new commitment to God's law after their return. Here's what's interesting about the book of Ezra. The first 10 chapters of Ezra fall, well, there's 10 chapters, but they fall in two divisions. Chapters 1 through 6 reports the first return of some 50,000 Jewish captives under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel, whose name in the Hebrew means born in Babylon. That's around 538 B.C. Chapters 7 through 10 reports the return of a second group under Ezra's leadership about some 80 years later. Interestingly, it would almost help us better if this were divided into two books and chapters 1 through 6 was called the book of Zerubbabel and chapters 7 through 10 was called the book of Ezra. 
maybe some of you have studied Ezra before and you're kind of like waiting for Ezra to show up and Ezra doesn't even show up until chapter 7, you know. Uh, but because Ezra organized this book and organized as they believe a lot of the Old Testament, many believe Ezra is the one who even wrote Psalms 119. The book is named after Ezra. The book of Ezra provides a great study on how to rebuild from ruins as it chronicles the precise Spirit-led, God-blessed steps the Israelites took as they returned from their captivity to their land which had been destroyed and reduced to ruins by their enemy captors. Next week, we're going to look at seven principles. And I actually would love to give you some heaven work, right? We don't call it homework. We call it heaven work. Here's some heaven work for you. Read the first five chapters of Ezra and see if you can come up with, in other words, when, when they return, there's things they're doing and God's blessing it. So that's how you know that one, it was spirit led what they were choosing to do, not just arbitrary. They weren't just kind of feeling their way through, well, I think we should build an altar. Well, I think we should sacrifice. Well, I think we should hold this feast. There's things they're doing, but because God's blessing every turn of what they're doing, you can see that these are actually steps that God is honoring. So if I'm studying a book that's theme is rebuilding from ruins, and they're taking steps to rebuild from ruins, and God is blessing each step along the way, and the Bible says that all scripture is profitable, Obviously, there's something for me to eke from that, to distill from that on how to rebuild from ruins in our lives, how to rebuild from scratch. And if you look at your own lives, what areas are there that need rebuilding? What about when your prayer life has just been completely thrown out the window. You've been a Mary for so long, you forgot to even how to pray. Even when you pray, you pray like a busybody Mary. You read a prayer talking about a place to settle your heart with God and you can't divorce yourself from just behaving in the prayer closet like it's just another chore that overwhelms you and you feel like there used to be a time when it was different. I feel like my prayer life is in ruins. How do you rebuild? Well, you can apply the steps in Ezra on how to rebuild a prayer life. A ministry. How do you rebuild or how do you start from here in a ministry? Relationships. Parenting. Marriage. Whatever it is where you feel like, wow, you know, through this or that or just a series of events, you know, there's, there's, there's something that needs to be rebuilt. There's trauma. There's something that's come in. It's time to rebuild. What about starting a business? What about starting a new project at the job? What about a startup? Entrepreneurship. These steps in the book of Ezra, because they are God-blessed at every turn, and we know that everything we do is spiritual. There's no such thing as secular. Everything we put our hands to is spiritual, which means that we're to apply the mind of Christ and spiritual principles there are steps. And you can tell right now I want to get into that message, can't you? You can tell that I just want to start giving the seven steps. But let's do this. There's something else we're going to look at in the remaining time. But next week will be seven steps for rebuilding ruins. Seven steps for building a new work. Seven steps for, for starting from scratch. God's way and to receive God's blessing. Now, is that something that all of us desire? Because believe me, and I'd even ask you even now, if thoughts are coming to mind of areas that you would love, not that we, you know need to be rebuilt, that you would love to see rebuilt, uh, you're just caught in a pattern and you just know that this pattern's become a habit and it's just an easier way. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, but there's just an area of your life where you just feel like it's just a heavy yoke. The Lord promises abundant life in every area of our life, and there's just maybe some part of your life that you feel that just uh, abundant life just seems like a separate concept when it comes to that area. We're going to follow these steps next week. So, the book of Ezra chronicles the precise spirit-led God-blessed steps the Israelites took 
as they returned from their captivity to their land, which had been destroyed and reduced to ruins. Just as important, the book of Ezra shows the power and importance of trusting in the goodness, grace, and faithfulness of God to speak to us with a timely word in season when we need it most. And also the importance of not only receiving, obeying what God shares with us, Haggai 1, Zechariah 3, just some of the many examples, but cultivating a heart that's ready to hear from him. The books of Haggai, Hebrew meaning is exaltation of God, and Zechariah, Hebrew meaning remembered of the Lord, both report the ministries of these two prophets and how God used them, spoke through them, when God's people needed encouragement, perspective, correction, and vision the most. Most of all, therein is the sweet reminder that though they will fail God many times over, God will never fail and never leave or forsake his beloved people. So in this remaining time, which I'm thinking, I don't want to say it because I don't want it to be famous last words, but in this remaining time, let's just dive in now. The first thing we need to see is this. Joshua 21 verse 45, when the Lord led the Israelites into the land, remember, he brings this defenseless, small nation, relatively speaking, out of Egypt with no walls, no high tower, no fortress, no weapons, and women and children. He says, one of you will put a hundred to flight. He says, I will take you into a land that flows with milk and honey. It is a land with giants. It is a land that will make you feel weaker than you've ever felt when you see the obstacles before you. But yet if I am for you, who can be against you? And I will lead you into this land. I will go before you. I will be a pillar of fire by night. Any of you scared of the dark? I'll be your nightlight. I'll be a cloud by day. It gets a little hot in the desert, but I'm going to be your shade. And the Israelites got a little bit thirsty. And we can't relate to that. A little bit thirsty, a little bit tired of manna. And said, you know what? God, you just brought us out here to kill us. You turned the world empire upside down. Flipped the number one economy of the world upside down. Split the Red Sea. Green berets that wanted to kill our wives and children wash up on the shores as we're worshiping in Exodus chapter 15. But the minute we get a little thirsty, we just start doubting the whole process. And you know, that's the story of them rebelling. God even says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, you know, I led you through these trials to prove you and really see where your heart was. And to see, one, so you would see how ugly your own hearts can become, which would make you all the more eager to have my heart instead of your heart. But all that being said, I love this verse and everyone should know this verse. He takes them into the land after all of these battles and rebellions and warlocks and witches and giants and them worshiping idols and the golden calf and just nothing but failure on Israel's part. But God's promises are yes and amen. And he brings them into the land. And it just so humbly yet omnipotently says this, not one of the good promises which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel failed. All had come to pass. So for us as New Testament believers, verses should come to our hearts like Philippians 1.6. He who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of his return. Jude 24, unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you unimpeachable before the Father with joy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, faithful is he who called you, faithful is he who will do it. Bring up the next quote by Puritan John Flavel, please. Grace makes the promise, providence makes the payment. We just read in Jeremiah and Isaiah, the promises of all of what he'll do. 
Grace makes those promises. I will blot out your sins. I will bring you back from the 70 year captivity. I will bring you back to ruins. I will build up the ruins. I will raise up a pagan king who doesn't even know me. I'm gonna make him great, even though he'll never give me the credit, but I'm gonna make him great because I'm gonna use him and turn his heart to give you all that you need to return. That's all grace. Grace makes the promise, but then providence makes the payment. Similar to Isaiah prophesying that a virgin will give birth to the Messiah. And then Micah prophesying that this Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Grace makes the promise. But then you read in Luke chapter 2, how when a woman is in her third trimester, do you get her when there's no Uber, no Uber Express, no Acela, no Amtrak, and no planes? How do you get her all the way to Bethlehem to have a child in her third trimester? Grace made the promise that a virgin would give birth to the Messiah and that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Grace makes the promise. Providence, God's sovereignty is what makes the payment. How do you get a woman in her third trimester over there? Luke chapter 2. It says that God put it on Caesar's heart out of the blue to tax the entire world and everyone had to report to the city of their registry. Grace makes the promise Providence makes the payment. Now we are so ready for Ezra. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia. Ready? So that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia. Surprised? This is what Isaiah said would happen. And he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, and he put it also in writing. And he said this, Thus saith King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever remains in any place where he sojourneth, whoever doesn't go on the journey, well then let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Who's going back? I'm providing the open door. Carte blanche to go and rebuild. Who's going back and whoever stays behind, you financially support the ones who are going. Then, verse 5, rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites. And look at this. With all them whose spirit God had raised. Look at this. When God's people deserve nothing but captivity because of what they did. When God's people deserve nothing but the timeout bench. Disqualification. What does God give them? Revival. He's stirring the heart of a pagan king. Now he's stirring the heart of his people. And mind you, this is a difficult task in front of them because Jerusalem wasn't down the street. Would you write down 900 miles away? 900 miles away. Four-month journey. But God's stirring hearts and causing a revival to go down. Let me tell you, no matter what you're going through, let the scriptures be your go-to and the faithfulness of God and the track record of God and the promises of God. What you need is revival. What you need is personal revival. You know it is when we're all going through it and there's a million things going on, you know, and it's like, well, what's going on? What do you need? And then we could just talk about every single need but miss the number one need. And you may be right in all of those needs, but what we need is a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit and for God to stir our hearts afresh because God's stirring hearts. Now, mind you, they're in captivity, but remember at this point in time, they went into captivity to the Babylonians, but the Persians had conquered the Babylonians. 
This is not Egypt. They're not being whipped by taskmasters and building much of what we still see in Egypt to this day. They had created a lifestyle and a culture for themselves here. It was comfortable here for them. Yet God is stirring their hearts to want the things of God more than anything else where all of a sudden even a 900 mile journey to the unknown over four months is like, hey, no problem, let's go. That's, it's just details, right? God is giving a revival. It says, verse 6, And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, gold, goods, with beasts, precious things, besides all that was, underlined this, willingly offered. One thing, people are just giving to the work of God now. Just giving to the work. Everyone wants to be involved. This is a revival. Also, Cyrus, look at this, the king brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and put them in the house of his gods. Remember when the Babylonians conquered and led the Israelites into captivity, they also took all of the holy vessels from the temple before destroying it. And it would be Nebuchadnezzar's successor, Belshazzar, in Daniel 5, who at a drunken party said, yo, we're going to turn this up another level, pull out the vessels that were taken from the Israelites. We're drinking and toasting out of those tonight. Belshazzar, that would be the last cup he ever drank from as he would die that night. But would any of them have ever imagined that God would touch a pagan king to bring forth those vessels to now be handed, to be taken back? You see... What I wrote, can we please go back to the second paragraph on page one? The entire Bible is, in essence, an account of an eternally benevolent God who chooses to give grace to his people as they deserve nothing but judgment. The entire Bible points to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which alone satisfies the justice of God and allows grace to proceed towards all those who call on his name while never contradicting his holy justice. The entire Bible showcases God's work of grace in and through weak and fallen man, the same mankind of whom even at their best state is still incapable of anything righteous or good. Thus, the entire Bible makes abundantly clear why God alone gets all the glory for anything and all things and everything. Having now unpacked Jeremiah and Isaiah and now looking at the fulfillment here in Ezra, who alone gets all the glory? Who's, how many heroes are in this story? So, don't we need to be so careful in our Christian culture of today that's doing a great job of learning so much doctrine, but losing awe of the person of Jesus Christ. And while learning so much, 2 Timothy 3 says, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Meaning, always reading and learning but not keeping the main thing the main thing. How much we suffer by not keeping Christ as the hero and the highlight of every meditation, every Bible verse, every song we sing. Everything's got to point to Jesus. Why? Oh, because you need it. It gives you more peace when you do that. No, there's a deeper reason. Because he alone is the worthy one. He alone is the hero. And to cut any corners or compromise that is to rob God and be non-biblical. Now do you see why he says in Isaiah chapter 48 verse 11, I will do this for my glory and I can't give my glory to another. Why would I even pollute my own name like that? Amen. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I will not give my glory to another for why will that? It's like robbery. So, Verse 8, even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath the treasurer, numbered them and gave them to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Sheshbazar is the Chaldean, the Babylonian name of Zerubbabel. Who was Zerubbabel? Well, he's the one that leads them back. But who was Zerubbabel? Josephus, Jewish historian, tells us that he was the king's bodyguard. 
All of your Jewish captives all had found nine to fives and were now eking out a culture as Jewish people in the Persian Empire. So Rubabel's job was he was the king's bodyguard. And look who God is raising up to lead this expedition back. Verses 9 through 11 numbers everything going back. Chapter 2, it tells us that these are the children of the province that went up out of captivity. These are the ones that were carried away and went back to Jerusalem. You know, Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 26, if any man serves me, my father will honor him. Look at all of the record in chapter 2. The names are memorialized forever of the men and the people who went back for this journey. Roughly 50,000 people went back. Chapter 3 begins to highlight what they do when they return. You will find my seven steps, as I look at the steps of rebuilding from ruins, the steps of starting a new work for God, the steps of, of, of going back to the drawing board, the seven steps of how to successfully start something from scratch, Mine start at chapter 3. We will unpack that next week. I'm afraid time's not allow, going to allow us to go on, but um, I would so love another hour with you guys right now. Someone say, go ahead. Don't say that because you know, you know what happens when someone says that sometimes. <laughs> but listen, we will look at those seven steps. But this is what happens in a nutshell. Please follow me. 50,000 people respond to this revival. First thing I say to myself is, Lord, when you're stirring your people in this day, if I look at this story, 50,000 is a big number, but compared to the amount of people that stayed, it's a remnant. Lord, when you're stirring and doing a work today, I want to be in that number that gets stirred. And knowing my own heart and all of us knowing our own hearts and so much going on, how easy could it be? How easy do you think it was to justify staying back? How easy do you think it was to just justify staying back? I mean, Jesus gives a parable of a man that knocked on his friend's door and his friend just said, hey, I'm already in bed. Kids are in bed with me. You know if I even move an inch, they both wake up. I mean... How easy would it be to justify staying back from a 900-mile, four-month journey? But you see, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. It's only when we lean on, into our own understanding that we start seeing numbers like 900 and four months. Lord, when you're stirring your people, I want to be a part of that. And Lord, am I in tune with your stirring today? You're stirring in Philadelphia, and it's not about what's trending the most or what's got the best hashtag or the most views. Oftentimes, I mean, everybody was in Jerusalem hashtagging it up, and it was in a small place of Bethlehem where a baby was born and laid in a feeding trough. So is it always about where the most noise and religious activity is? Biblically speaking, oftentimes it's not. So Lord, when you're doing your stirring, Lord, Lord, would you do a work in this heart that I'm hearing what you're stirring, lest, like Jacob, you wake up and realize, whoa, there's nothing but grace, but man, missed that one, you know? They return, and they do these steps, and you need to look at the steps. I don't want to start giving stuff away. But they return, and, and they're unified. Ah, there needs to be unity when you're going to do it. It says they return like one man. 50,000 people, but they were so unified, it said it was like one man returning. Whoa goes back to revival. We need God's spirit to even do something right. They build an altar. Before there's even anything else, they build an altar. But they build the altar the old way that Moses prescribed, where not a human tool could even go to it, lest any human feel that he contributed to making something pretty to approach God. It had to just be like a kid with sand at the playground, something humble, so that you realize you bring nothing to the table. Humility, unity, they keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They sit around and it says they're scared of their enemies. They list their fears and deal with them. See what I mean? Their points are there of what 
you need to walk through when you're attempting to start a work, pioneer a work, or rebuild from ruins in any situation in life, business, personal, family, whatever. Then the warfare comes in. And we're going to get into that as well. That could very well end up being yet its own message. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, hey, there's an open door in front of me, but there's a lot of adversaries too. And open doors bring adversaries. In chapter 4, you're going to see warfare break out. Then you're going to see the people who are building get so discouraged that they're not going to work on God's house for 16 years. Discouragement is in this book. And how if you're attempting to do anything, pioneer anything, rebuild anything, there's going to be discouragement as well. And that is where Haggai and Zechariah come in. That's where Zechariah comes in. And it says the work halted. But would you go to this please? It says in chapter 5 verse 1, Then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, the one of whom both have a book at the end of the Old Testament, they prophesied under the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel even unto them. Go to chapter 6 verse 14. And the elders of the Jews builded and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah. What did they say? Oh, they came in and said a lot. You see, in the midst of doing the work, in the midst of rebuilding from ruins, God's people needed a reminder. Zechariah comes in and says, you're trying to do this whole thing in your own strength. That's why you're burnt out. But it's not by might, nor by strength, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord. We know the verse. That's the context. Obviously, it's what they needed to hear because it says in Isaiah, in Ezra 6, for that they prospered after they got the reminder. You see, there's a lot in here. And hopefully you now see why we couldn't even get into Haggai and Zechariah without first unpacking Ezra and seeing where they came in. Amen? So this is where we'll close, and let's have the worship team come up, please. This obviously is an intro. We're going to be delving more into Ezra, and we're really going to be looking at what Haggai and Zechariah come in. They come in with perspective. They come in with encouragement. They come in with rebuke. But everything is a word in season. These three books are here to encourage you to look for a word in season wherever you are. Where are you right now? And in what areas of your life could you use a fresh vision, a word in season, a revelation from God? Even if it's like Habakkuk said, Lord, I need you to speak to me Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1, even if I'm wrong, I'm waiting for you to tell me. Thumbs up, thumbs down, um, edit, or just take everything, I've, you know, my whole diary, and just say, no, the whole thing, just, just none of that, none of that's redeemable, you know? I got to <laughs> reprogram you to even like write in your journal correctly, Lord, I'm waiting. How many need that? Well, we all need that. This is here to encourage us in that regard. So please, for your homework, would you read the first four chapters, five chapters, as I've given out some hints, and start to look for what you personally believe. And I don't think there's any right or wrong answers. It's not like, oh, uh, none of my seven appeared on the screen. <laughs> you know, if what you get from that study, if it lines up with the word of God and it is biblical, then that is, that is a step God is speaking to you. Read through and just see. You might come up with 20 points. But this is a book on how to rebuild from ruins, how to start from scratch, how to go back to the drawing board, and you could apply it to any and every area of your life. We're going to be looking at that. And then next week, of course, we'll be getting a lot more into Haggai and Zechariah and what they had to say. Uh, I'm about to give away another one, but here we go. Zechariah, he returns with a high priest named Joshua. Not the Joshua that succeeded Moses, another Joshua. The warfare was so weird. 
It was just plain weird. Anyone ever go through warfare? It's just plain weird. It was so weird. They needed a revelation on their warfare. Isn't God so good that he doesn't just come and give you a verse like, hey, put on the full armor of God, and then God just disappears? Because we can make this stuff so cliche. They needed revelation on what the world is going on. It's tough, and I can't even get my finger. I would just like to get insight on, on which way to even look to face the storm coming. There's a storm. I don't even know which way to look. He gives him a vision in Zechariah 3 of Joshua the high priest standing in front of the Lord and Satan is there trying to resist Joshua because Joshua is trying to draw close to the Lord. And it says that Joshua is covered in stained clothing, but the Hebrew means excrement stained, feces stained clothing. No doubt part of the warfare was even Satan attacking the personal, the heart, the, the, the accusations against a Joshua. And then what does the Lord say? The Lord says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. It's not even like, hey, Joshua, Learn how to rebuke. Rebuke louder. When you say it, you got to pound your fist. When you say it, you got to quake a little bit or put a hand up or something or do a little Holy Ghost dance. The Lord does all the heavy lifting. The Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He says, is not this my brand plucked out of the fire? I yanked him out the fire. You don't have to tell me where he came from. I, I'm the one that yanked him out the fire. He's hot for service. And then the Lord applies the gospel in Zechariah 3. Take the feces stained clothing off of him and put all new white linens on him. My brothers and sisters, we're going to get busy in Ezra, Zechariah, and Haggai, but there's a lot to chew on right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now do you see why I'm up at three in the morning? Like, Lord, it could be three different messages, all timely. Where do we go and what do we do? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, if today achieved us knowing a little more about your word, achieved us falling more in love with your word, achieved us loving the gospel more and feeling more than we did an hour ago that you are sovereign and you are jealous over your people, then Lord God, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Give it staying power in our hearts. Give us a hunger to continue to dig in these things. Thank you for Ezra, for Haggai and Zechariah and how it is so much needed in our day and for us, Lord. Lord, you already know what next week has in store. Would you prepare our hearts? And Lord, we want to maximize what you have for each of us through this journey, Lord. Lord, thank you so much. We love you. Lord, we pray you would receive this afternoon's offering, Lord. And Lord God, this is worship. This is where we worship and celebrate and that you allow us to contribute and co-labor with what you're doing, Lord. May these monies, holy, be used, Lord God, to spread your gospel to feed those and clothe those who are naked and to continue the kingdom work you've given us to do around the world. Give us godly fear and wisdom with every penny. And Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.